Welcome everybody to Permaculture Smackdown. This is episode 40. 40 weeks we've been doing this. Well, it's been more than 40 weeks, but 40 episodes we've been doing this. And uh, so today I thought we should go through all of the comments and questions and stuff from all the videos of previous episodes. So that's what we're doing. <laughs> Dana, wow, 40? Hell yeah, 40. So uh, earlier, before I go into it, just break into the comments, um, I was talking to Paul and Paul was like, it's been a dark day, man. <laughs> so, um, so I would like to apologize on behalf of Paul for the horrible comments he's going to give. In <laughs> your comments. Oh, so I get to kick all these people in the nuts? Is that what you're saying? I feel like that's what might happen. Uh, <laughs> so I hope you enjoy today's show of horrible it's, awkwardness the last few days have been like that whole thing where it's like a, a death from a, a thousand cuts uh, from a thousand tiny cuts it's just been tiny it's like they just have been pouring pouring in for the last couple of days yeah little all these little problems that need to be solved on a on a good note, uh, check out PDC Vid V I D like video dot com P I C P D C V I D dot com. Um, that's a page I just built for Paul, and I'd love your feedback. Let me know what you think. That is a nice page. Nice job, Josiah. So something in the plus column. <laughs> See, I'm I'm working on the positives, Paul. Let's get yeah, you a little happier. I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate that. And, and I got to, you know, it's like when you're, when you're having such a dark day and you start getting all pissed off, it's, it's always good to think about, you know, okay, the, the positives. And so, you know, I got to say, you know, Jocelyn spoils me 20 times a day, every day. I mean, you've been here, you've seen what she does. She's just a spoiling machine. And, uh, and so there's, there's a, plus not only that, but there's, I was kind of thinking about this earlier. Actually, I was talking to Jocelyn earlier. There's like 40 or 50 people that are involved either in the empire which is all the online stuff or the lab you know and and they're doing like a good part time or more um so there's there's a a, a lot of um a lot of very strong positive stuff going on but of course if you're going to have that many people doing that many that many things uh, all the time, all day, every day, day after day. Eventually, you know, all the thousand little cuts have all got to show up to your door. Yeah. And, and you got to sort it all out. And each one is just taking a long time to sort out. And so it just happens. So for comments and questions and stuff, what do you think, Paul? Should we start with like the oldest comments first or the newest ones? Yeah, let's do the oldest ones first. All right. Um, Where are they from? Where are these comments from? YouTube? Yeah, most of them are from YouTube. I did pull some from Facebook. So I'm going to tell you what episode they're from. Those are the YouTube ones. I had to guess on the Facebook ones because I have no idea what the episode numbers were on Facebook. Uh, okay. I hate Facebook. All right. Uh, sorry, Facebook. We're live on Facebook, everybody. Uh, <laughs> I don't hate them that much, I guess. Josh right. says the uh, brass cod piece is in place. <laughs> He's, he's ready. He's prepared. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, what I'll do here is, yes, Facebook sucks. Hey, thanks, Dana. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post it into chat, Paul, and everybody else so you can see it. Oh, okay. Um, All right. So this is the first one. It's a long one. And this is from Nick. Nick says, why on earth would you use swales in a climate like Northwest California with winter dominant pre precipitation and dry summers? Swales are great for infiltrating water when the soil is not saturated and you are getting, run, uh, you're getting runoff, e.g. big summer thunderstorms. It's easier to hold the water with vegetation with much less risk. 100% ground cover, 100% of the time. Earthworks can be fantastic, but making them the main focus of permaculture is nuts. Ooh. I feel Paul boiling at the second comment, but liking the first one. <laughs> first of all uh where's the where's the question i was looking all through there i didn't i didn't no, see this one's more of a comment oh okay it's questions and comments they're not all gonna be questions so basically a comment we could go just you know shoot arrows into that all we want and yeah. make make rude gestures and sounds so i would 
I would say um, swales are. I like swales. I use swales a lot, and you're absolutely right. Saturate the the ground with ground cover. That that's also part of it. I don't, I don't see why you wouldn't use both. Uh, there are times where there's no way I'd use a swale. Like there's higher, and usually that's slope for me. I'm not too concerned with much else but slope, and I know Paul disagrees. Well, we, we talked about swales pretty good in the last episode, right? And so this must be from before that. This um, is the first episode. Right. So, but this is, I mean, but we talked about swales quite a lot in the last episode 39. Yeah. Right? yeah. This is a comment on episode one. Yeah. All right. So, um, okay. So the last statement, earthworks can be fantastic, but making them the main focus of permaculture is nuts. I, you know, all right. I've, I've been down the permaculture road a long time. And apparently I was doing permaculture before I learned there was a word permaculture and um, whatever, whatever, whatever. The, the thing is, is that if you're going to ask me, what is the main focus of permaculture right now? My answer is going to be, community like like that's 90 percent of it how to get 20 people to live under one roof under a, one roof without stabbing each other that's that's really the, the biggest challenge in all of permaculture that's what i think now now granted i came at this from gardening and it's like okay when i'm talking about horticultural endeavors gardening feeding yourself food systems things like that then uh, if we're going to limit it to just that, uh, and, then, and then focus on this, uh, earthworks can be fantastic, but making them the main focus, focus of permaculture is nuts. Um, I'm going to say like, okay, my thinking that earthworks is a main focus of permaculture. No, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, earthworks is a, is a big part. And it's a big part of design. Yeah, of design. And yeah. I got to say that um, like, Okay, in the, in the World Domination Gardening uh, three DVD set, it's basically video of me teaching a workshop. And, and basically a big part of what I teach is, is, um, is to be an artist instead of an engineer, which is weird coming from an engineer. And I, I kind of feel like going onto the land and then make it up as you go. It's not going to be that bad if you do something, you know, now, granted, if it's easier to change things on paper than it is out on the land, but um, there were there were things that we did, and as we were going along, then different then the like the, the the site owner started getting new ideas and stuff. But he wouldn't have gotten those ideas unless we at least tried something. Yeah. Okay, okay. Backing up, the question is: Is Earthworks main focus of permaculture? I'm going to say that, um, yeah, I don't think it's the main focus, but I would, I would say that it, I agree that it is a main focus. Yeah. And, and that that is good, right? If we're limiting permaculture to just the horticultural part. Um, I like to, you know, I, I, the, the, probably the, the engine, the engineering portion of permaculture is very important because things can fail a lot if you don't do that. And the art portion is very important because you want people to enjoy the environment you're creating. Um, what's great about the art portion is that it adds challenges and new ideas come about, new processes come about, new ways of doing things come about by implementing those, those artistic features in. Um, I can't remember what Jack called it when we are but we, we talked about this in great detail, but it was, uh, it, it was basically designing for the wife, right? In, in that situation was designing for the wife. Like I got to put in pretty stuff because this is all just, <laughs> it's just all engineering and it doesn't look pretty and the wife's going to go fucking nuts. So it's like, uh, so you got to, you got to implement that kind of stuff too. And you want that beauty too. Uh, you want to be in a nice, calm, relaxing place, not something that looks like a machine. Um, and so I think it's, I think it's definitely you're right. You're spot on where it's adding the art and the engineering together, which can be really tough for people. Cause a lot of people think only with the engineer brain and not so much with the art brain. And a lot of people think with the art brain, not so much the engineering brain. All right. Ready to go on the next one. Yep. All right. We've got some yep. comments. 
uh, uh, Mitchell says that uh, he's, he thinks that uh, the principles should be the main focus. Um, ben, Ben is talking about humus ditches. Uh, Essentially, I made humus ditches out of my pathways between beds. They catch my duck pond overflow and chicken runoff. Awesome. Now I don't have to water for the whole summer. Yeah. Oh, man. I, I took a video. Uh, I was at my dad's place, and he has a bathtub uh, out on a cliff. You light a fire under it and make a hot tub, basically. Like a total redneck hot tub. But it was really cool how he had the drainage system for it because it went into his garden beds. Um, <laughs> that was cool. Okay. All right. What it reminded me of. Uh, cool. You don't have to water. All right. Next comment is from Crydolf. Obviously, YouTube. This is why Permies doesn't uh, allow you to have weird, fucked up names. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Crydolf says. I liked it a lot better when the stoner was the guy to cut out of out all the time, since Paul is clearly the interesting one to listen to. Um, I guess yeah. I'm the stoner one. I don't smoke <laughs> very much pot. I was I remember joking about it early on, like this show is gonna be fucking chill. Like I could smoke pot if I wanted to on this show. show. So I guess that's what uh, they're referring to. Uh, if you don't like me, fuck off. What do I, what do I got to say? Uh, go, go. If you just like Paul, go check out Paul's podcast. He has his own podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I like that message. <laughs> I'm just that arrogant. Oh man. It's nice um, to get a nice message. Like, in fact, you know, I feel really bad because whenever anybody does a really nice thing for me, like they'll either send me a big long note about Paul, you are so amazing and awesome. You are the best. Now, huge long message saying all that stuff and i have no reply i don't know what to say uh you know well, you'll so I, end not, and it is, I end up thinking like okay i'll come i'll write a better i'll write a lovely reply later and and then i it just gets caught in the email river and it's gone yeah. and i feel bad when i remember it later like that was a really lovely message i'll send it to jocelyn you know <laughs> hey jocelyn <laughs> just so you know <laughs> I'm this person thinks I'm really great. So, uh, by the way, if you're gonna um, give praise to someone's work, like you enjoy Paul's work or my work or you hate my work, um, I it, it's it would be great. We're right now we're dealing with this where we're trying to we're like shit. We need testimonials. Like we should be showing people what other people are saying and liking about the, these products or the show or whatever. And it's like, fuck, all the testimonials we have are just emails people have written us. And we can't use those because, they, you know, well, we'd have to email them and say, hey, we liked what you said about us. Thanks. Can I use this publicly? And can you send me a picture of yourself and all kinds of shit? Um, but we're looking for testimonials. It's always great if you guys do that. If you want to head over to the forums or whatever and, and say what you, what you get to say. We should try to get testimonials from like, um, see if we can get something from Jeff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. See if we can get some from Marjorie. Uh, and and how about um, uh, uh, the the permaculture chickens guy? Why am I blanking on his name all of a sudden? Um, the chickens guy. Uh, Joel Saladin. No, although yeah, that'd be good too. Joel and I are friends, uh, but. I haven't talked to him in a couple of years, but when we get together, we really, yeah, Justin Rhodes, there it is. Oh, yeah. Justin Rhodes. Um, but I'll, you know, there's surely there's some people like in the permaculture world that I've helped out a bunch of times. And it's like, hey, could you just write, we're trying to, I don't know what, but I think what you, the, you're saying testimonials for all kinds of stuff, but it seems like this kind of started with, you need testimonials for the, uh, the 177 hours of video for the PDC and HTC. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to, because that page I just mentioned earlier, I, I made for Paul, that's what I made it for, it was Paul's videos, the 177 hours, PDC and ATC. And uh, I was like, man, I really want to put some testimonials in there. Paul, send me the testimonials. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you did that. <laughs> well, yeah, you did. You said, Paul, so then, and I said, okay, let me just go talk to some guy that I know. Uh, hey, Josiah, go get those <laughs> testimonials and give them to Josiah. 
Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so that's where that. Um, so, hey, you guys, it'd be really great if you left some testimonials. <laughs> that helps us. All right. Um, oh, speaking of, I wanted to, before I go off on too much of a tangent, I want to. Zaya's connection is cutting out a bit. That's right. That's what I thought, too. Yeah, I just moved. I'm in a new location. I, I haven't set up the new router and all that shit yet. So I'm just getting what I got. Hopefully it stays good. Um, so where we're going here is youtube.com, Permethos YouTube channel is Permaculture Smackdown. That's where you can see all these comments that we're talking about today. If you guys want to respond to their comments or something like that. It's interesting <laughs> you brought up Justin Rhodes. I was on my see, related channels. I guess I should subscribe to these. I have Paul Wheaton. May as well subscribe to that. Justin Rhodes. There you go. Subscribe to that. Oh, I am subscribed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. There you go. Okay. Next. So I, I kind of want to fire these off because there's a shitload of them. So hopefully. All right. Next. Uh, this one's from Dana. You'll like this one, Paul. Boats. X, I have no idea. There's no substance to this one. Boats. <laughs> Laugh out loud. Paul is so awesome. There you go, Paul. Boats. I don't know what that means. Cheese! Cheese! Yeah, Paul is awesome. Cheese! <laughs> All right. Pie! The, Pie! <laughs> the clink says, here's a permaculture farm in Kent, southeast England. Land, uh, Landu's Meadow .co uk. Okay. I don't know what that's related to, but there you go. If you want to check out a uh, permaculture farm in Kent, Southeast England, there's one to check out. Uh, let's see here. And I guess, man, I should do the, do okay, it. Justin. I think that's proof that you're not exactly filtering these in any way. Nope. I'm not I am okay. on, on purpose. Okay. I, I, there were some I filtered that were like, just totally like there was nothing we could say or show about that. Okay. So I don't know why, that guy was like, you got to check this one out. Oh, okay, now there's a picture. There you go. There it is. Landusmeadows.co.uk. We yep. like fields. Yep, meadowy. Very meadowy. Go oh, key line plowing. Oh, swales. They call those swales, huh? It looks like key lining to me. Anyway. Um, cool. Next. Okay. This is from... GMB catastrophe and it says sorry I might be butchering your weird usernames um, one of the few arguments I think Paul loses is the wood chipper argument that's got to be a useful technology and a very sound mulch I think he won he won the chicken argument I, I think he won the chicken argument apparently we were having a chicken argument Oh, I won both. I, I won both. <laughs> I get to eat pastured eggs now, and they are so good. Good for the chicken. Eventually, it will become a sensation for the integrated farm. Ooh, would you? One of the few arguments I think Paul loses is the wood chipper argument. He's wrong. I won that one. I, I oh, won that argument. He's just course. mistaken. He <laughs> just doesn't know what he's talking about. Just a screwball. Actually, this is probably one of those good things to say where it's like, hey, my philosophy is there's no good place <clears throat> for a wood chipper ever. Uh, there's just no use of, for it. it. They're loud. They're stinky. They're, you know, they're, they're just terrible. Um, and uh, I think that, I mean, it, it's one of those things where it's like, uh, okay, uh, uh, and, and it's a great example of uh, replacing people with petroleum, which is kind of the opposite of permaculture. And, and so permaculture is replacing petroleum with people. So it's like, okay, we've got all this big wood and these branches and stuff like that. Uh, I bet I could come up with 20 things that you could do with that instead of chipping it. And so um, it's like, uh, I don't, I'm against, now I do think that it's, it's possible that you're going to want to, you know, uh, uh, maybe you're going to want to use it to build something. Maybe you're going to want to use it for fuel for a rocket mass heater, or maybe you're going to want to, I mean, the list of what you can do with all that stuff is tremendous, but I'm, I, I choose to not chip. I, my position is don't chip. It's just not worth it. Please don't do it. I, I would like to persuade everybody in the world to stop using chippers all, all around, but I know I'm not going to. 
Is that just because they're gas powered? Like if it was a, a solar powered chipper, would you be against it? I think I'd still be against it. I mean, I'd rather see, you know, I'd rather, I mean, like, let's say, let's say everybody in the world has an electric car and they have an electric chainsaw and they have an electric sawmill and they have an electric everything you could possibly imagine all electric. And then it's like, and then you're like, okay, we get a, we get a, an electric wood chipper for free thrown into the mix. Do you want to use it for anything? I'm going to say, no, there's nothing for, there's no place where I'd want to use it. I would want, I would prefer to, to, uh, um, process all this wood for something else to use it. In fact, I, I like what Ben Law does where he's kind of developed a symbiotic relationship with his woodland. I mean, if the dude's got 40 acres, don't you think that a wood chipper would be pretty handy for him? And does he, does he have one? Does he use it? He, no, instead he's got like at least 20 different uses for all this wood other than chipping it that all come before chipping it. And basically the thing is, is it's like after you've gotten all these other uses out of all this wood, it's like, okay, now anything that's left to go put it through the wood chipper. Sure. Well, there's nothing left. And I'm saying that's if everything else is provided and you get the wood chipper for free and it's an electric wood chipper. It's like, no, there's, you're going to, you know what, if you go out and you use a chainsaw or you're doing, um, you're, you're, you're carving wood or you're doing whatever, you're working with it, you end up with some sawdust, you know, uh, a sawmill, you end up with a lot of sawdust. And that's mm -hmm. different than chipping it. So all your sawdust needs get met along the way of doing all these other things. So, <clears throat> all right, I, yeah, I'm, I won that argument because basically that's my position. And so if that guy's got a different position, well, naturally I think his position is fucked up. I think I must have been arguing against it, um, and I think he was agreeing with my position. That's what I think. But, I mean, I, I see, I agree that there are a lot of good uses you could be putting into small pieces of wood, things that you could throw through a wood chipper. Um, but I am also fine with you using wood chips. I have no. Yeah, so then uh, Christopher's asking, are wood chips not a reasonable weed control in a garden bed? No, they, they are. Now, um, you want to be careful about where you get your wood chips from, because if it comes from an urban area or if it comes from like something that's next to a pasture or something like that, very good chance that those wood chips contain some sort of persistent herbicide. Yeah. So be careful. And wood chips are a waste of energy and lose the fungal habitat. There you go. Structured intact wood provides. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I would also argue that you're going to create fungal habitat by using wood chips as well. Um, but yeah, you would be destroying existing fungal habitat by chipping it. <laughs> if, uh, boy, like if the, if it's very green wood, it is new fungal habitat, uh, whether you chip it or you don't. Right. But the other thing is, is it's like, uh, don't, don't be putting wood chips into a hugel culture. If you happen to have wood chips for whatever reason or sawdust, don't put it inside the hugel culture bed. Put it oh, yeah. the outside as mulch. Yeah, you're just going to shrink your bed putting it in. Sorry I'm late. Are we answering questions? Yes, Julia. <laughs> uh, ben, it's like an abandoned city for pioneer fungus. All right, so people are getting pretty uh, excited about. Maybe we should have a whole wood chipping uh, show. Um, I like wood chips. I use wood chips. No, I don't use them in in Hugo culture beds. That makes no sense. Um, there's good uses for wood chips, but it's not something. There's no way I'm going around and like cleaning my the woods out and chipping all of it. That's just stupid. There are far better things you could be doing with those uh, pieces of wood. Um, uh, made any out. Okay. Next, moving on. You ready to move on? Or are you looking something up? You want to I'm, talk? I'm trying to find, I, th you know, I think that there was a thread out at, 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 uh, Permies and, um, oh, here it is. Does Paul hate wood chippers? If so, why? I wonder if that's the one that sounds like, that sounds like me being awesome. And so the thing is, is that there was something where it's like, 
I'm going about my day doing my regular stuff and I came across something about wood chippers and um, there's, and finally, and I read whatever was in it and I started writing like, this is, this is not okay. This is a bunch of shit. And so, but that must not be the thread. This is not the thread. Okay. Looks like it's pretty heated. It's quite a bit of comments. Here we go. Here we go. Four um, years ago. Oh, the world has changed with wood chips in the last four years. All right. Go to, go to thread number six, three, two, seven, two. Six, three, what? Two, seven, two. Wood chipper advice. Okay. Go about 15% of the way down. Okay. And then if you go about halfway down, there's people adding to my list. Oh, look, this one guy's got 40 things to add to the list. <laughs> Toothpicks, white birch. Okay. Well, there you go, guys. If you want to <laughs> dive into the oh. wood picker, there you go. Yeah. I just kind of feel like if, if, you go to if you have a if you use a wood chipper at all i i feel like you're doing it wrong um but you know clearly this other person will think that you're doing it right and uh and i i guess i don't think very highly of that person's opinion especially when they say paul loses that argument <laughs> well i think he loses that argument neither, neither. uh julia we were and, and I, yeah, I should go through the wood chipper. Those I'll go through that form and, and see if it changes my mind. Um, Julius. So Julia, we're going through questions and comments from previous episodes, but because you are one of our live members, you can ask questions throughout the, the show. And she has one she says our soil is extremely acidic such that they recommend 9,999 pounds of lime per acre. Any ideas? Ooh. Okay. <laughs> All right. I mean, I I do not. I have not been to Julia's new property. I know she has she has an urban property and she has a rural property, and I think she's probably talking about her rural property. And um, I have not been there, um, but uh, I think it's between. Portland and Eugene, Oregon, both two places relatively famous for being soggy and lots of rainfall does lead to acidic soils. Um, the next thing is, is that I kind of feel like, um, all right, uh, before we start monkeying, yeah, blueberries, uh, says Dan, that's, that's right. There's plant lots of things that love acidic soil. Uh, and, and Julia points out this is regarding the rural property, 40 acres, pasture forest, and a, an abandoned apple orchard. And we talked about orchards last episode. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I mean, the first thing I would want to do is to be like, okay, you got 40 acres. Is, is there like a place where people kind of live on there yet? Uh, is there, because I don't like, as we talked about last, last time, I, I don't like broad acre techniques. In fact, if, if you're looking for broad acre solutions, you know, like just putting lime down, then um, I, I would rather that you talk to a different person that's kind of into that. Oh, there are two houses and, and two people live there full time. Okay, cool, cool. So <clears throat> first thing I would say is, is like, okay, have you, have you built some hugel culture beds? I mean, I want to talk about what you're doing in your zone one, zone two stuff, which is probably going to be berms and hugel culture beds and adding texture to the landscape. That would be what I would do. And I, and I, like, I like answering questions like this the way Sepp Holzer answers questions like this. Is this like, I am Sepp. When I come to your land and I own it and I kick your sorry ass off of it, here is what I'm going to do with your pathetic land. I, I love that approach. And so it's like, uh, so, okay, if I'm there, what am I going to do? 
and I'm going to add texture to the landscape. And in fact, um, this year, and this is like, uh, uh, and this is what we're going to be doing. So we've been, we have a rocket mass heater. So we've been burning wood. And so this year for the first year, we're going to take some of that ash and we're going to start putting it out on a, on a few different spots. Um, and, and it's like, but we're not going to just, because of course, um, what they do is, is they're saying put down 9,999 pounds of lime per acre because it's all so acidic. And, and it's kind of like, uh, um, well, in order for them to give you that answer, they asked you, what are you going to plant? And it's like, they don't want to hear polyculture. <laughs> they're, they want to hear like one monocrop. What's your monocrop? Yeah. And so... Um, uh, and then they're gonna they're gonna re make recommendations uh, um, based on that. But I I like the answer from Dana. Blueberries. Oh, so many people struggle to get their soil acidic enough for blueberries to grow good blueberries. And and it's it's really not only blueberries, but there's a lot of crops that really love an acidic soil. And so it's like Sweet clover, uh, buckwheat, comfrey. Those will all do. Rhubarb. Comfrey will help you change to a more alkaline. Comfrey does. Comfrey, comfrey makes the, the, a wonderful environment for earthworms is, is putting out this little dusting of calcium on the top of the soil, which earthworms just really love. But uh, uh, there's, I mean, there's tons and tons and tons of stuff that loves an acidic soil, and that would be a great help. But the thing I'd like to advocate is, is that as you are building your hugel culture bed so it says we have a few few hugels those are in process um i was wondering if there is any alternative to lime like what would wood ash do so wood ash is an alternative to lime but uh you gotta be careful don't don't be throwing it on in big gobs because it's it's with those big gobs when mixed with straw and water that's how you get lye and so you know don't don't be heaving it on. In fact, I think what you want to do is like as as you build your hugel culture beds, I would put a dusting in in spots, no more than one third. Um, you know, like like two thirds get no dusting of lime, one third gets a dusting of lime, and and do it in your layers as you build up the hugel culture bed. <clears throat> and so then, uh, uh, when it's all done. Then uh, dust parts of the outside, one third, not, the, not a whole layer, like, like two thirds of, your, of the outside of your hugel culture bed get no lime and one third gets a dusting of lime. So what you're doing is you're making edge. This is pH edge. And so then the plants that like the, the higher pH will do well in the higher pH area. And the plants that don't like the higher pH area will do well in the lower pH area. And then there are some plants that kind of like it in between, and they're going to flourish along the edge between the two and find that sweet spot. I think the, the best thing to do, although it takes the longest, is to have your plants change the acidity of the soil the, to level the pH. So if you can incorporate the plants that will do that to the soils, that's better than inoculating with something that is just going to wash away. But it would, I, I understand why, why you want to do it. You want to plant certain plants. You want those certain plants to grow and they're going to do better in a soil that's not so acidic. I'm just saying that if you can think about it more as a slow process where the plants are going to change the soil for you rather than you just changing the soil, um, it's going to be a healthy environment, I think, long term, but it does take longer. <clears throat> uh, Julia says, I tried to propagate comfrey last fall. My cuttings rotted. I, I want to express that it's like, um, I mean, I put a lot of thought and, and Jocelyn does a, a huge, she, she, she's working on all kinds of processes that I'm not even exploring. But it's like, um, all right, here's, here is some of our waste product. We uh, heated with uh, wood. And now we have all this ash that is built up. And I don't want to take it to the dump. This is a valuable resource. And there's tons of things you can do with ash. In fact, we've got a huge thread at Permies about things you can do with wood ash. But 
at the top of the list is um, uh, using it to help adjust soil pH. And um, uh, so uh, it's rather than thinking of it as like, oh, I'm augmenting my soil, which by the way, uh, this is a great time to put out A, Sepp Holzer has never put any kind of fertilizer or lime or anything on his soils ever. B, Joel Salatin says that not only is he never putting fertilizer or lime or anything on any of his soils, he's never even put down any seeds. So, you know, I think, I think that these guys are the pros and we're all pussies. And so, you know, let's, let's, let's play it that way. And, um, uh, but and Joel Salatin has a lot of birds running around his property, which are good for um, providing uh, pH balance or alkaline. All the bird manure is uh, good with alkaline. Um, as with anything that composts, it, it does tend to become quite alkaline before it becomes neutral. Um, and so, but I would, I would have to say it, it's, is it going to, I mean, I would imagine that for chicken shit, it's probably going to start off with a really high pH, but I think it might end up at neutral, I think, but I, I don't know. I mean, it's like, Hey, let's, let's get our pH meters and go find out. He's got a ton of it too in, in concentrated areas because he's doing the, the runs. And so yeah. he's got 50 birds in a, a small yeah. area that are pooping up the place. All right. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. Oh, so the thing, the thing I was trying to say was, is that the masters don't try to even fiddle with pH. Um, but, uh, at the, but I'm not, and, and as much as I want to travel their amazing path, and and follow them and what the amazing things are doing. I do kind of wonder if in their zone one, if if they're doing things to augment by using things from zone two, three, four, and bringing in some resources from that to help with their zone one gardens. Um, and and I can't get up a thing, even though Joel says he's never put seeds out. He's talking about you know out in his fields. Um, I can't I can't help but think that in his gardens he has. And the same thing goes with um, Sepp Holzer. Now, uh, um, that said, I'm, I'm not looking to like go out and um, uh, start liming everything and like, what am I gonna use as a lime substitute or am I gonna go buy a lime? I'm not looking at, I'm looking at all this wood ash and at the same time, I'm thinking like what I want in my gardens is diversity. And so I kind of feel like what I wanna do is, is create some, some uh, some wood ash zones, like, like wood ash dusting can go here. You know, here I'm gonna put a, get a couple of fiberglass posts, I'm gonna stick them in the ground and put a little sign on them that says wood ash. And it's like, okay, between these two posts, put a dusting of wood ash, like, you know, 10 feet wide, just a dusting. And uh, you could do it a couple of times a year maybe. Um, and then have these set up all over the place. So that way, I'm always dusting in the same place. So some spots end up staying um, whatever the natural pH is going to be, and other spots are going to have a higher pH, and so different stuff is going to grow. Fruit trees appreciate a higher pH. Um, so, in fact, Julia mentioned that she's got an orchard going on there. I wonder how her orchard's doing, or if it's kind of like, you know, those trees are like aching for, for some comfrey or something to help improve. And maybe she's going to have to like do a slight dusting of um, uh, uh, wood ash just to get the comfrey to get started, you know? Um, all right. <clears throat> she's well, she was saying that it rots. And so maybe, I mean, still, that, I don't think that should um, make you not want to plant comfrey. I think if it rots, it's fine. It's just rotted comfrey. I mean, you're not going to harvest it. Like, I think what she's saying is, is that she put the little baby countries in the ground and then rather than, you know, boing, I'm oh, country, I'm here forever. Gotcha. And it went, <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. Which, see, different. A lot of people use uh, wood ash during the winter to ice on their ice, which is interesting because snow and ice is uh, high acidity. <clears throat> and so that kind of balances things out. 
uh, they do it for traction, right? So that they'll spread ash on the ice so that when you walk on it, it doesn't, you know, it's slipping all over the place. You know, another place I've been thinking about is how um, a lot of people, when they uh, have an outhouse or something equivalent, then uh, they'll throw lime or wood ash in there. And then I've told people that when they brought that up, it's like, don't do that. That's asinine. You're basically mummifying your poops, which does make them stop stinking, which is what they're going for. It's very effective at that. Mm -hmm. um, but do you really? And now here I am, and with our um, uh, willow feeder system, we're looking at how to mummify the poops with with you know sawdust, so that way uh, we have as much uh, uh, carbon and nitrogen to be able to to feed to willow trees two years uh, down the road. And it's like, oh, maybe rather than sawdust, we should be using lime or or wood ash because we got plenty of wood ash. I really like you using sawdust. Um, I like the smell. I really like the smell that it puts out. Um, it conquers the poop smell and you get some wood smell. I like the wood smell. But. I think it'd be good to kind of, at this point in time, maybe what we ought to do here is offer people their own choice. Use whichever one you want, <laughs> you know? Because really what we're trying to do is we're trying to get it to all stick around until, you know, the pathogens have left two years later and then feed the whole thing to a willow tree. Yeah. That's, that's the big thing we're shooting for. And so it's kind of like, uh, all right, let's, you know, a little bit of wood ash in there would go a long ways. And, and we've got plenty of it now. Yeah. And willows aren't going to have any problem with the wood ash. Yeah. Especially in a highly acidic area where willows are growing anyway. All right. All right. Let's go on to the next question. All right, next one is something to do with bats. I'm not sure about it, but it's from the clink. It says, read somewhere that if you paint them a specific shade of purple, it cuts bird strike down by lots, and it's no more uh, abrasive to the human eye than the gray they paint them now. Supposedly, they smack bats out of the air too, but I would have thought they'd be able to hear the blades churning the air. Maybe it's like the whales, they can hear engine noise, but it seems like it's coming from everywhere for them. They might, yeah, it must be windmills. Thank you, yeah. Julie. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess he's saying paint your windmills purple. Okay. Next. <laughs> to stop bird strikes. <laughs> cool. I, I mean, I never thought of it. Uh, cool. Um, I've seen orange. I've seen orange painted windmills, and I'm not sure why they paint them orange. Maybe it's something to do with that. You know, I've had a lot of people go on about how windmills are so ugly. And in, in that movie, I believe it's called The Age of Stupid, um, they've got the guy that's trying to put the windmill farm in, and then the woman who is trying to not because Ooh. they would be an eyesore. Yeah. And it's like when I travel to Seattle, we go through that vantage mm. area. And it's a massive wind farm. And I'm sorry, that is like, that is like an art piece. It's, it's moving, living sculpture that also generates huge amounts of power. Those things are magnificent. I, to me, they're just, I love to see them every time. And it's like, um, I have to slow down so I don't crash. I, I, yeah, because you're like, what? Yeah, going through uh, Las Vegas, the same, yeah, the solar panels aren't as pretty, obviously, but um, it's, it is it is mesmerizing. You're driving, you're like, holy shit, look at all these windmills, and especially uh, the windmills on those, like, rolling hills of, uh, in farmland and stuff. It's like, all right, if we're going to monocrop, that's cool. Put some windmills in. At least we got that going. <laughs> I, I'm, glad, I'm glad that this, uh, that somebody got paid to put in this magnificent art installation. And, yeah. that, and that they continue to get paid to, to maintain it. And, it's, than and it, it has a use. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bonus. I think uh, windmills are most beautiful when they're like on homes. I love seeing windmills like popping out of a roof. Um, I think that's really, those are really, it's just really cool to me. But whatever. You know what's really fucking ugly? Those cell phone towers, they make look like trees. <laughs> <laughs> really ugly. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Uh, next one's from uh, Esteban. 
Esteban says, P.S. Uh, I didn't see a comment before that, so I guess uh, anyway. But yes, Julia should also know the vitivir grass uh, has been used around the world for slope stabilization. The coast of the Castro Valley is mild. There has never been a frost cold enough to kill vitivir grass. Plus, it is an excellent fodder for grazers. What is that? Am I saying that wrong? I've never heard of this. Never. Bit of okay. Well, there you go, Julia. You've been told. Next. <laughs> <laughs> now I kind of want to know what the hell that is. I'm going to look it up later. All right. Uh, the clink says, "Could you auger a hole, say, 10 meters down at an angle that's that's perpendicular to the angle of the slope?" Fill it with compost and then plant a tree there. If you grow the tree in an extra long but extra thin air pot, why what, why hasn't someone made one of uh, one out of compostable materials yet? And made sure to tamp down compost around the roots once it's in there. Could that work? Also, they use willow and ivy for bank stabilization around here. Though I know that some of you aren't too keen on ivy over there across the pond. There's some places in Washington state where uh, ivy is, has become a very serious problem. But of course, everywhere where it's a serious problem is on properties that are larger than one acre. And um, uh, like, like- Don't have people managing them. Yeah, yeah. And it's kind of like, to me, it smells more like if that ivy is bothering you to a point that it's like become this big of an issue. I think that um, the problem is the ratio of people per acre um, for, for managing. So, but um, I have a podcast with Owen Hablitzel and he did a bunch of greening the desert work over in this place called the Sahara Desert. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's in books and stuff. I hear it's really, uh, really nice and cold and yeah. At night. <laughs> yes. Uh, at night. One of the things, <sighs> one of the things that uh, Owen said is that uh, the first time he ever ate camel meat, he says it's actually quite tasty. Uh, it's it's rather delicious. It's fatty as hell. You, you know. ate. You, you've had it. You've had it. I didn't think it was very good, but. Okay. Okay. <laughs> good. Lots of fat. If you like fat, it's. <laughs> so. Um, or maybe it was just the part I ate. Maybe they gave me like the hump or some part of the hump. Oh. Which I think it was more cartilage but anyway, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, all right. Um, in this podcast I made with him, it's like, okay, let's you and I green the Sahara Desert. We're going we're gonna to turn it into a uh, tropical paradise. That's a know. big fucking project. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's like... Um, uh, and so it's like, well, what do we do? What are we going to do? So now um, I threw in a suggestion. It's almost exactly what's being suggested right here. And I said, let's, I want to t get a, a variety of taproot trees and I want to make a hole in the ground and somehow be able to fill the hole with um, this fertile fill, like, like something that's like 30% compost that goes down 30 feet deep or 10 meters, like what has just been described to us. And, uh, and, and so put a taproot tree in that, so the taproot goes zoom right down there. But they have a lot of water around there that is trapped, um, that is like, you know, 20 to 40 feet down, a lot. They get a lot of water around the, those like um, big, big dunes, gather a lot of water and big rocks gather a lot of water in the, anyway so so one of the things that he was saying is is the big problem there is people and it's like if you if they see anything green growing anywhere <clears throat> it's gone like it doesn't last a day and and the people you know grab it and take it and use it and so then he had pictures of a garden that was growing there that was behind these 10 foot tall walls. So people couldn't see that there was a garden in there. And then you can have a garden with, you know, it's, it's, it's locked up in such a way that no one can see in there that there's a garden. 
as long as no one on the street could see that there's a garden, you could have a garden. And yeah, so the, so doing that, I think that's a great plan. Um, you know, throughout this desert area, so I'm I'm thinking like um, the Nevada, you know, deserts in Nevada, high high Sierra stuff. Um, so you do that in combination. It's all about edge. It's all about the edge effect, right? Growing that edge out. Because what's happening right now is, and the reason deserts are being created is because of edge. Edge is dying and deserts is expanding. Well, if we can reverse that process and bring the edge back and focus on getting the edge to, to shrink the desert, to, to come back, and, and spontaneously creating edge within it as well, uh, yeah, that'd be great. I, man, when I was living in, uh, I lived in Las Vegas for six years. Uh, that was a horrible time in my life. But um, I always thought it would be uh, great. So th there's a highway that goes from Las Vegas to Los Angeles and long stretches of deserts. And on the weekends, like on Fridays especially and um, Sundays, traffic is terrible. Like you'll just be sitting in traffic for 100 miles. It would be the perfect place for a permaculture uh, site to show people what permaculture is. You're like, just a big fucking billboard that says this is permaculture. And then I have a hundred acres of a permaculture property right there in the middle of the desert. I think that would be, because there's hundreds, millions probably of people every year that are seeing, they're stuck there looking at desert for hours at a time. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And a big sign that says, this isn't even irrigated. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, now I heard that there is a project going on in the Sahara uh, where they've they've made a green belt across the Sahara. Um, it's really enormous. It's an enormous project. Millions of trees have been planted. Um, so there's big stuff going on. I don't know the details. I I saw like a little mm. sixty second blip on it, and um, I have not investigated further. That would probably be easy, easier to manage, um, but I would think that having like little islands all around the place would be better. And, and to the point where those islands start, the edges grow and they start connecting to the other islands rather than a belt that's supposed to grow out through the middle of it. Okay, but if your primary problem isn't the heat or the lack of water, but human beings, I You're think it's possible the belt might be a better solution. Right. Easier to protect, easier to manage, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. All right. Uh, Dana says, I think that area is riddled with conflict, um, which, is, which is like riddled, but, you know, they're Skittles. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but, <clears throat> yeah, that's what I've heard, too. In fact, uh, when Owen was there, there's pictures of him walking through the desert, like, look at me, I'm walking in the desert. And these two guys with machine guns, those are my guards to keep me alive. <laughs> so yeah, there's uh, Can you guard the, the strip of land here, please, instead? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, wherever he went, he had these two guys with machine guns that were with him all the time to protect him. In Afghanistan, um, you'd see kids with machine guns in their fields. You know, they're just protecting the field. Wow. <laughs> all right all right next question this is another one of uh esteban telling julia stuff <laughs> julia, hey, julia you got a fan <laughs> julia should know that uh on the other side of that hill range of costa valley someone planted grapevines for slope stabilization and not for winemaking there you go all right yeah i see a lot of people using grapevines for that that's a good idea um, especially in Washington, actually, is where I see that a lot. In uh, around uh, like Walla Walla area. All right, uh, this is from the Clink. The Clink says, "Desktop dinosaur here. The phone screen can't compare to a tablet or anything. As for not listening to anything a fat person, drunk or junkie or whatever sees, it's patiently, uh, patently." Patently absurd. For one thing, they could be saying, don't want to end up like me, do ya? Also, like Paul says, says 
Uh, him or anyone fat has nothing to do with how good he or is at it. Uh, at the he's practicing, I guess. At something he's practicing. <laughs> if anything, seeing how he's in the food communication business, it's a good testimony. Were we fat shaming? <laughs> I, I, I think. I think he's trying to support me and what I say, despite my being fat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think, I think that's what he's trying to do. It's probably in response to someone like calling you a fat ass or something like the, well, this guy shouldn't be saying shit. He's a fat ass. Um, yeah. You know, I'm, I, I'm okay. I, with that I dare that anybody <laughs> to, to live with Jocelyn and not be fat. <laughs> um, She's, well, I mean, it's argument. like, First of all, she prepares three meals a day that are wonderful. And then, and then in between each of the meals and in the evenings, she says, are you, are you hungry? You, want, you know what, I'm just gonna, I wanna make you a snack. I wanna go get you a snack. And, and it's like, uh, I thought maybe, maybe you'd like uh, a little bit of this, you know, or whatever. She, I mean, it would be all, and it's like, you're just thinking like, no, I shouldn't have a snack, but that sounds really good anyway. <laughs> now that I see it in front of me. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, and so, um, She's a, she's a food pusher and she just loves to cook and man, she makes some amazing stuff. So I have so much love for Jocelyn. What a wonderful woman. you got Yeah, there. she is fantastic. And so it's like, uh, <laughs> if you ever see me getting thin, then you should be nervous that things aren't so good between me and Jocelyn. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> that, um, that said, I have lost like 60 pounds, but I blame gallstones for that. Um, what do you think about fat shaming? Um, I, I don't get, I, I do feel like I've seen some people like I'm a fat guy, but I've seen people where it's like that. I like to stand next to them because they make me feel thin. You, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And well, also you're a giant guy. So a lot of people aren't going to sure. fat shame because they're like, that is a big fist that will hurt a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is weird when you're as giant as I am, I, uh, I haven't had many physical altercations and a lot of people are like, they're going to, they're talking about learning karate and stuff. And it's like, why don't you just be really big? That seems to work. <laughs> you know, don't, don't learn karate, just be really big. And so, um, I remember I was at this one office where there was this guy, he was a fucking bully to other people. And, um, he just, and he had a mouth. He was like, he wanted everybody to know that he was king of the hill constantly. And his cube was right next to mine. But I'm a contractor, and I've got some pretty powerful philosophies and professionalism. If you're paying me a certain amount of money that's way too much, my job is to shut the fuck up and get back to work. And, um, and, a, and I, my job is also to set the pace for everybody on how much work they get done. So this guy would just mouth off and mouth off, and I just tuned him out. And then um, one day he goes to Hooters for lunch and he gets a sticker. It's a round sticker and it says, I heart Hooters. And uh, I don't know, a lot of people are threatened by a giant guy. And, and so he stuck this sticker on my nameplate on my cube. And um, so I got up and I looked at the nameplate. So now apparently I heart Hooters. Um, <laughs> And, and so, but what he didn't realize is, is that our nameplate actually slides in a little plastic sleeve, a clear plastic sleeve. So he stuck that onto the clear plastic sleeve. So I pulled my name out and put my name on the desk. I popped the little plastic sleeve out. I went over to his plastic sleeve and popped it out. And then, you know, put the I heart Hooters plus, and he lost his shit. <laughs> and he came at me swinging. Ooh. And I, I just aimed my ass towards him while I continued with my job. And he's pounding on my back. He's like an average sized dude, but I'm telling you, didn't really do a lot. And so I just proceeded to put his, take, you know, put his name in there and take his plastic sleeve and go back over to my thing and put it all back together. And I didn't say anything. I'm just doing this. But he's just losing it. He's Fucking the whole office knows that he's screaming and losing his shit. And um, 
And I was prepared that if anybody like, I don't know, some boss type, but see, that's it. Part of it is a lot of the work I did was with the executive branch. And so I don't know if the executives come down and they're like, what the fuck is going on or whatever. And then if they wanted an explanation for me, I just felt like I'd say he accidentally stuck the sticker on the wrong thing and yeah. I just fixed it. And you know, that would be my explanation. I don't need to mention the fact that he started to physically assault me. Um, but the thing is, is that it totally freaked him the fuck out. That, that his best, his biggest, you know, pounding did really nothing to me. It, and, and so uh, that kind of became a little bit of a theme for him. Like, I've, I think I heard him say 12 times after that something like, well, you know, what we should do is go get Paul to lift up a car and put it over there and stuff like that. I can't lift a car. <laughs> but, yeah, being really big is a, is a great thing. Now, you were saying something about fat shaming. Um, I get a lot of it. I get a lot of people that are just and I, what I and here's what I hear. I hear a person standing up, waving frantically, going, "Look at me! I'm a dumb fuck." <laughs> and then they're trying to point at me and say "dumb fuck," but I see them. I see them pointing at themselves and saying "dumb fuck." You know, it's like um, I, it just seems it just seems asinine. So there are people that are really big, and what I and what I think when I see them is I think that. A, they're, they're really big, but they're really fat, um, but they don't, have, they don't have Jocelyn feeding them. They're going to McDonald's, and they're eating all these. They're, I mean, they're, they're consuming. Lots the, of wheat and, yeah, a lot the of. The big gulp. They're doing the big gulp. They're, I mean, burgers. and because it's, a lot of times they don't seem just fat, but they also seem, they have kind of like an, an unhealthy complexion. Mm-hmm. They, they, they look like uh, they, they, they look like they're soaking they've been soaking in sugar they've been eating just tons of sugar and I got a, the same thing I gotta tell them. yeah that sugar is damn tasty I gotta tell you man pie is wonderful stuff um, and uh, so I, I kind of feel like part of what we're doing I mean imagine imagine what would happen if you brought that person out like like you know okay I'm imagining what Wheaton Labs is going to be like in 10 years. Mm-hmm. All, uh, all the food that's cooked here is from polyculture food. And um, so what happens if they come out here for a week and they can eat all they want? A, I hope that they find that it's tastier than what they've, had, what they've been eating, which I think is a, a relatively high bar. I mean, fast food is some, some tasty stuff. Although I find that if I go and I try it now, it, it does taste really weak. Uh, it's plasticky. Yeah, yeah. It tastes yeah. like man. This was made with plastic. Like, like <laughs> what they used to do is they used to pour the petroleum fertilizers on the ground. Stuff <laughs> would grow, and they would convert that into food. But uh, now it's like they're trying to skip a couple steps. It's like, <laughs> let's just put the plastic right in the food. We have we're, a chemical that tastes like this food. We could just put the chemical with the oil. We this the stuff we call bread with quotes around it is actually kind of a foam. <laughs> so uh, made made out of you know plastics and rubbers, but um, I I kind of I I I like to think that they would come here and uh, uh, they would naturally lose a lot of weight and um, they would gain a lot of fun experiences mm. and they would think it was great. Now, granted, a lot of them are going to be of a mindset that's going to be like um, uh, there wasn't enough porn there wasn't enough uh uh football uh there wasn't enough i mean whatever is the thing that they're already into but i hope i can come up with stuff that's going to be more interesting while at the same time uh I'll, you know because i think a lot of those people are going to be suffering from a variety of health problems that has nothing to do with their obesity yes exactly um so i'm i I'm okay with fat shaming, uh, but there's fat shaming I'm not okay with. Like, you, you just took it too far or whatever. I think people need to realize that they're – like, I just don't like people flaunting their fatness and saying it's good. That bugs me. Um, I think you should go for healthy. I think that's always better is go for healthy. And if you're healthy, you're not incredibly fat. Um, now, there are reasons 
What? You don't like that? I want to shit all over you. You know what? What happened to letting people do whatever the fuck they want? Yeah, that's you true. You know what? If, if they want to go and eat at all the fast food restaurants, and, and by the way, eat far more, as long as they're leaving me alone, I don't care. But you know what? I like the idea of being able to um, offer them a better alternative and that they, and that they like the alternative. Build a better mousetrap that I can make something that they like better. I like the idea of doing that. Not saying you have to stop eating that and do this other thing or whatever. So Josh is saying something about healthcare and it's like, you know, I don't want to get into the healthcare thing because it's kind of like, that's a whole nother debate. I, Josh, you better put on that brass uh, uh, cup there, dude. That, what, what was it? He wasn't saying, so it's, ah, uh, oh, fuck, what's the word? The word, the, the word brass is, cufflink or whatever. No, no, it's the thing. It's the cod piece. The brass okay. cod piece. Get that brass cod piece on, Josh. <laughs> so it's kind of like, I think, I, I think that the thing is, is it's like, okay, first of all, if if healthcare is saying that we got to go and fat shame somebody, then our healthcare system is broken. Yeah. First and foremost, right off the top, and it's kind of like, okay, next up. If somebody wants to eat themselves to death, that's their fucking business, and I support them all the way. I, I'll, you know what? I wanna, I wanna sit next to them and eat and have and enjoy food as much as they're enjoying it, because I'm sorry, enjoying food is a wonderful, wonderful thing, and I like the idea of sitting next to them and and having them enjoy some of my food when we're ten years from now and things are fucking awesome here. Fat shaming, I don't appreciate it. I don't appreciate it directed at me. I don't appreciate it directed at anybody. And if somebody's going around saying, you know, don't be fat shaming me. And, and it's like, I kind of feel like they've got a point. But as far as like fat pride and stuff, okay, if they want to do that, I mean, there's, you can have pride in whatever you want to have pride in. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with people doing it. I just have a problem with it. I, it just annoys me that it happens. Like, I, I'm not going to stop someone from doing it. It's just annoying to see. I, I think I would rather see, I, you know, it, it's more enjoyable for me to see people that are happy about being healthy rather than happy about being unhealthy. Um, I think I think if we want to see change, we got to be the change we want to see. We got to yes, absolutely. And and it's like when we provide them with something that's going to help them with their health, like through polyculture and all of the things we talk about here in the permaculture smackdown. And if we provide all of that, then we give them a scenario where they could do it. We got to make it taste better than whatever it is that they're eating. They got to make the experience better than whatever they're experiencing. Yep. And it's like and we don't force them into it. We don't shame them into it. We offer it and say. I just like to see what happens if you eat it. I hope you like it. Well, I think it, when I say fat shaming, I think that is a form of fat shaming is like being around, like if you're, you have a community and there's a bunch of healthy people eating great food, getting a lot of exercise, enjoying life. That's a form of fat shaming. To, and you invite someone over that's fat to see that. That's the form of fat shaming. That's saying, I want this unhealthy person to come and see us and expose them to this lifestyle that they could have. Hopefully they will enjoy themselves and be happy and see that there's a healthier way to live. Now, there are a lot of reasons why people are obese that aren't things that, that, that piss me off when there's fat shaming, right? So it's like- Like when they're pregnant. <laughs> so more like um, <laughs> lots of times people that are raped when they're young are fat because they put on a lot of weight so that men won't be attracted to them. That's true. That's true. Things like that. And that's where it's like, it's not going to help that person. They, now, it might help them with that. They want to, they're like, okay, I should be thinner and I need to do that. But they have a deeper conflict that needs to be addressed. Um, I was picking something up at the, at the uh, Home Depot once. And this gal is like, uh, she, she came over and she's doing the, the checkout thing and everything. And and I can't remember what exactly she said. And she said uh, something about, I think what she meant to say is that I'm five months along at, being, at working here at the Home Depot. But she says, I'm five months along. And, oh. and it turned out, I, and I said something. I can't remember what I said. But um, like, like, have you decided what you're going to name the baby or something? 
<laughs> because she was a bigger gal and I thought she just said I'm five months along. And, and so um, it's like, can't really tell that much, but I guess, oh, I stepped in it. I Never assume, says Josh, and I agree. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hindsight, both of you. Hindsight, yeah. Yeah. That's why sure. I should never talk to anybody in public. I'm <laughs> going to just make a mess. Oh, it's so terrible. I'm, oh, <laughs> I'm ashamed of myself for what I said. Oh, I feel terrible. All right, next one from Andrew. Ask Brian. Ask about Brian and what he is doing. Uh, hey, Brian, what are you doing? All right, uh, next one. <laughs> I don't know what that was about, but maybe Brian's doing some cool stuff. Love to hear about it, Brian. Um, let's see. Perma, uh, Perma Quilter is this person's name and says... I'm with Paul on this one, whichever one that is. I'll skip the talent night, forfeit the certificate, and be satisfied with the knowledge. Boy, there brings up some memories. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's always the option. You can always skip talent night. I, I think it's I – get, I get Mollison's point <clears throat> about talent night. You know, I think, I think what Mollison wants is he wants people – if you're going to give you a certificate – then you got to be able to go out there and spread the word. You got to go out there and preach the word of permaculture. And so <clears throat> don't be bashful. Don't be shy. Let's see if we can fix some of this. And, and today, I think it includes video. Now, at the PDC this year, I don't think we're going to be videoing it at all. Um, but, we've, but we videoed it the two years previous. We just never did anything with all that video. But uh, this year, it was like this, this, you know, recipe for like editing it on the fly, which worked out pretty good. And it's like, we got the video out now. And so now you can go and watch 100 hours of, of the PDC, including Talent Night. And I think that the cool thing is, is that when PDC you go to PDCVid.com. Yeah, PDCVid.com. And uh, I, I think that the cool thing is, is that uh, you see what an in-person permaculture looks, or in, an in-person permaculture design course really looks like including talent night including all of the anxiety about talent night and i mean and and then i i, and I told my story which is like when i took my pdc for the first time then uh, they said okay you know you got to do talent night i'm like i know i'm not i'm not doing that well then you don't get your certificate and that's the whole reason i came at all was yeah. to get the certificate and um and it's like, uh, so I was kind of pissed. I mean, I didn't say anything to the guy that was running it, but I was feeling pissed off. Like, I didn't know. They should have told me. I, maybe I wouldn't have signed up if I'd have known that. I was, I, was, I was pissed. But, you know, within 24 hours, I calmed the fuck down and figured out what I was going to do. And it all worked out fine. I, I, I think I told a stupid story. Do you think it would have been more... Would you have been more pissed if they were going to say, and it's going to be videoed and live for people to watch? Well, this was in 2005. Video wasn't very common, but um, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think that that mattered. I thought what mattered was is I've got to come up with something. I mean, I, when you get towards the end of the PDC, you start getting kind of wore out. Yeah. You know, I mean, you've been at it. Because Your mind is full. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're just pooped. And you're like, what, I have to do one more thing? I have to add on to all of this? And it's like, so the thing that was pissing me off was having to come up with something. Well, you got to get creative. When your mind's packed with all this information and you've been focusing on design, which is a creative process, you've been expending a lot of creative like process and knowledge and you've been gaining a lot of knowledge and now you're asked to do something more creative or an additional creative thing. Uh, or at least present something, which in its own self is creative, the way you present, things like that. Uh, but it's an important process. There's a reason it's in a PDC. It's important to do, to have that talent. That and, talent. Then there's, and then there's some people where it's like, um, I am not going to tell people about permaculture ever. I'm going to, I don't need to do the talent night thing. I don't need the certificate. I am going to be fine, you know, and it's like, that's great. Just do that then. And now look at you. 
All right. Um, hey, we're at an hour and 15 minutes, man. <laughs> we haven't even gone through. We're so... And so concludes part one. Yes. We are number 10 in episode 10 uh, out of 40. So... <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, let me know what you start. Send me an email. Whenever you want to, if you want to do this again, if you think next episode we should continue this, or if we should wait another 10 episodes before doing this again. Hope you all enjoyed. I know I did. Hey, if you are a Patreon supporter, Paul Wheaton's Patreon supporter, or a Permetho student, you're getting special access to the before and after conversation that you're not going to see live otherwise. And so uh, go out to Patreon and support Paul or become a Permetho student. And uh, you can get special access to that. So for those that do have that special access, stick around. We're going to continue the talk for a little bit, uh, chat with you guys. And uh, I hope you have a great week. Bye. Bye-bye.